Hey, good morning. Do you have any questions for me? I know some of you are doing well on the assignment. I have people come to me and then some have other conflicting demands on your time, I guess. <laughs> So there was a request to extend the deadline for this current time. So I have updated that and made it to you next Friday. Okay. Yeah. Monday to Friday. Um, because I would rather have you attempt it and not give up. <laughs> so if it means that for those who have already done it, we get to get a break, take a break again. Um, the next midterm is scheduled for March 29. Uh, so I will plan to have, in fact, I have prepared another assignment, and then, in fact, I can put it up for those who want to look at it uh, in the head of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm talking to you about. There is an exam coming up on Sunday night. And um, it will focus on material that we have seen since the first midterm. So primarily developing the transfer function, linearization, dynamical response. Uh, so with that, we will complete the dynamic section of the course and we'll start, in fact, today we're going to start on uh, building the control blocks together. Okay. So I do plan to give one more assignment, number five, before that. So I'll, I'll put it on the model as soon as it is ready, probably sometime this weekend. But I will make it, I'm just preparing it because we have accepted the consequences of that. Um, I will make it due just before the exam. Is that fine? Just on the uh, okay. 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 I'm going to be awake this week for a conference. But I will be back on the 21st. So Thursday and Friday. I'll be available to consult if you have any questions about as you're preparing for the exam. Okay, so any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, you'll have you'll miss two classes, but I'll see that I can make it up later on if, uh, if there is a need. It will make up uh, it's, uh, special class. So on 22nd and 24th, Monday and Wednesday, there will be no class. I won't be here. I'll put up all these on the Moodle as well. I'm just uh, letting you know. Okay. Any questions about MATLAB, about last lecture, about your current assignment? Is the pace still okay? Am I going all right? Fast, slow? Okay. I have put, uh, and I will continue to do that, a few extra problems for those who want to look at problems and practice uh, solving a different problem, or which I will not put any solution, but if you have taken the initiative to solve it, and if you want to come and discuss that with me to see whether you are on the right track, I'm happy to do that. So bring the solution uh, to me and show it to me. Okay. And um, variations on those and variations on the problems that you do in your assignments could be the source for an exam question. Okay. Now I have posted the MATLAB function, uh, the script file that we wrote in the last lecture, but I've also included it in uh, the lecture notes today. So I think there's really nothing new to see. We have already seen how to linearize, how to use symbolic toolbox to do that. And uh, 
Yeah, one thing is about the eigenvalue. What is the relation? Why does that matrix, eigenvalue of that matrix, give you the information about stability? And I just want to briefly recap that, and then we understand why you are doing what you are doing. Then we will move on to uh, the next problem, uh, a second order problem. And with that, we will finish up the chapter on the dynamical uh, system. Okay. So we started off in the linearization process by saying that I have a given system of equations which I represent symbolically as dy dt equals f of y and u. Okay. So y is either called the state variable or the output variable. And u is the input variable or the control variable. Okay, so u are those variables where you will make a set change. In your current assignment, these will be the inlet flow rate, inlet temperature, uh, cooling water temperature, things like that. Whereas the state in your current assignment would be the temperature of the reactor and the concentration of the reactant in the reactor. Those are the states. Those are two the state variables in your case. So you get two other differential equations. Now, when I put an underscore like this, it says it's a vector. Could be any number of equations. So that abstraction you should be able to do in your mind and implement it for a particular problem. So we saw that when we do the linearization, we get the Jacobian matrix. So we get d capital Y dt, which is a deviation variable in terms of from the steady state. So the first thing, of course, we need to do is solve for the steady state f of y s u s equal to 0. And the only way that you can do that is by keeping u s as constant input. Well, you only have a constant input. There can be a constant output that you can have a steady state. And you get the steady state by setting dy dt equal to 0. So you solve that using f solve, which we saw. And uh, so you get these numbers, y s as input numbers, and uh, sorry, u s as input numbers, and y s as state variables. Then you linearize around that. And you get something like this, A capital Y plus B. Okay. So that is a dynamical linearized model around the steady state. Now A here is called the Jacobian. And it basically contains all the partial derivatives. For example, DF1, DY1, DF1, DY2, DF2, DY1 df2, d12, and just taking a two by two system, for example. Okay? You should be able to do the mapping. F1 and F2 are the two unknown functions. Y1 and Y2 are the two unknowns in your present assignment. It's going to be concentration and temperature. In the problem that we saw in the last class, it's going to be height in tank one, height in tank two, etc. And uh, B will contain uh, the forcing term. So B could actually be written as another matrix B times U in the linear form. Okay? So B will contain all the coefficients of known uh, input functions, multiplying the known input functions. What I want to focus is answering the following question. Why is the eigenvalue EIG of A, I said will give you the eigenvalues, and the negative, if the real part of those eigenvalues are negative, so then it's stable. In the current assignment, what you should find is under one operating condition, we have three steady states. I'm asking you to find all the three steady states, so I give you a different initial condition. Okay? And once you found that out, you need to decide which one of those three steady states are stable. So you need to evaluate this matrix at each one of those steady state values. Okay? And then pass that to EIG for each case. And then you'll get the eigenvalues. And you'll find that one set for one problem the eigenvalue real part will be positive. That would be the unstable situation. And for that, I'm asking you to go back and do the real simulation for the nonlinear problem. And you'll find that even if you start very, very close to the steady state, which is unstable, you'll find that you go away from the steady state and go to one of the other two steady states that are stable. There are a lot of important concepts in there. You might have seen this in the reactor code. I don't know. Have you seen it in the reactor code? Multiple statistics and stability. Okay. So this is, if you have seen it, this is good. It's a kind of reinforcement. If not, maybe go back and listen to this lecture again and think about everything that I have said. Okay. So when you have an unstable steady state, that's determined by the stability of this matrix. 
when you go back and do the full nonlinear simulation using OD equals sign, you will find that even when you start very close to the steady state, as you're starting, any small disturbance will take it away because it is unstable. It will go to uh, one of the other two stable steady states. Okay. So this problem and the next one I'm going to assign will contain a lot of these information reinforcing you some other forces as well. Then you can ask the question of how do I stabilize it, for example, in a stable state. Or if it's a stable steady state, how do I change the response time? How do I make it respond quickly? Those are the questions that we need to learn how to do later on. Okay. So the question, let me ask you and see whether anybody can answer this question. Why is that the eigenvalues of this matrix A tell us about the stability of the dynamic system? Hmm? Just know it does. <laughs> It is related to this graph that we saw, and at that time I already talked about it. And you have seen this before, and once I reveal it, you will know yes why. Okay, but I want you to retain some of this as well. So, if you plot the eigenvalues, for example, of this matrix, if the eigenvalues are in all these locations on the left half plane, the real part is negative, so it is stable. So, I already know because we answered in the exam. We had a question on that, right? So you know how the response of the dynamical system is. That is, in fact, the answer. The answer is the solution to this differential equation is going to be given in this form. A is equal to um, e to the power sorry, uh, alpha times e to the power lambda 1 t plus beta times e to the power lambda 2 t. For a 2 by 2 system, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are the eigenvalues of these. Okay? And y is a vector, so alpha and beta will be vectors, and those are constant numbers. Those are the eigenvectors, in fact. Okay, so related to the eigenvectors. So lambda one and lambda two are the functional form of the solution. So if the real part of lambda i is negative, then this says that the solution has to decay because e to the power minus something times t. Okay, and you normally represent this in this complex. Uh, real part versus imaginary part of the eigenvalue spectrum. Okay, so you plot all the eigenvalues. If you have a 10 by 10 system, you'll have 10 eigenvalues. You plot all of them and make sure that none of them are on the right hand side. If you have anything on the right hand side, then that is an unstable system. Pardon? The real part, this is the real part of lambda, and that is the imaginary part of lambda. On the x-axis, we have the real, ax, real part, and the y-axis, we have the imaginary part. And the imaginary ones will always occur as a complex conjugate, a pair. So if you have 4 plus 3i, you will have 4 minus 3i. As long as the original matrix is consisting of real numbers, you will always have them as a pair of uh, complex pair of uh, eigenvalues. So anything in red on the right hand side will be an unstable system. That's what you need to check. And the reason you need to understand is why is the eigenvalues of A determined that? Because the solution to this differential equation is given by this form, and this form dictates that if you want that function to decay with time, the real part has to be negative. Okay? That's the reason why uh, you expect the eigenvalues to be negative for stable system. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, why is the state that is this one? So the solution I'm saying, the solution y as a function of t in the time domain is going to be equal to a vector times e to the power lambda 1 t plus another vector. Because y is a vector, each one of these must be a vector. Okay, so those are two. There are basically two variables, two equations. And y in this case is the deviation variable. Okay, so as t goes to infinity, that deviation should go to zero. Right? That means y should be driven to zero. And that can happen only if you have the real part of lambda one and lambda two as well.
Ya. Right, exactly. So if you want to look at that in the Laplace domain, what you're going to do is you're going to take that equation and take the Laplace transform of that. And that will basically give you S times Y of S, because that is the Laplace transform of the derivative. Okay. L equals on the right hand side A Y of S plus uh, B U of S. Now it's an algebraic equation that you can solve to get the transfer function. And the transfer function will give you a relationship between y and u, the input and the output. y is the output and u is the input. So you can solve this. Again, it's a couple set of two equations in the Laplace domain, which you can solve, which is what we are doing, in fact, in this test. We are assembling the matrix A and B, but that matrix A is already in the Laplace domain. So this is another thing. I guess uh, I'm glad that you asked the question. When you are looking at eigenvalues, you are looking at the eigenvalues of the matrix containing only the linearized terms, A11, A12, A21, containing only the partial derivatives. But when you are solving in the Laplace domain, you are solving these equations that have S in them. So the result is going to be, I shouldn't have called it here, I should have called it something else. This is a matrix that you are solving in the Laplace domain to relate the output to the input, H to U. Don't confuse the, the two. The dynamics is determined only by the Jacobian. This is called the Jacobian matrix. Okay. And the eigenvalues of the Jacobian matrix give you the stability information. And you can choose to solve them in the time domain itself. And there is a recipe for doing this. And we have not seen that, and I'm not going to hold you responsible for that because we are taking a detour. From that point, you should know that why the stability is determined by the eigenvalues of the Jacobian, but we are not going to solve it in time domain. We are going to move to the, the, the Laplace domain because in Laplace domain, the equations are algebraic and single link is available, so we can look at the dynamic of the form from there uh, using single link. Any other questions? And there are a lot of concepts here, so in an exam you can expect simple questions that check whether you have grasped those issues. Okay. Uh, using simpler differential equations, I would ask you to find the Jacobian of a one by one in a single equation, for example. Get the transfer function, get the stability, and things like that. Now, the last example I want to do, if there are no questions, let's move on. Any, any other questions? Okay. Um, is an example not from chemical engineering, from but mechanical engineering, where you have this so-called spring and dash pot system. I think I talked about it earlier in the course. This is basically modeling uh, a spring-loaded door, for example, door stopper. Okay, so whenever the door closes, automatically there is a spring that brings it back, but you don't want the door to kind of uh, swing back and forth. If you have only the spring, that will happen. So you put a dash pot which dampens it, so a damper. So that's what is ha happening here. You have a damper and you have a spring and you have a mass attached to it. The mass is the door in this case itself. And you apply a force to open the door, for example. The question is what happens to the mass? It's dynamic. So you're going to represent that by measuring the displacement from its equilibrium position. So it's equilibrium position is closed door and you are opening it and it's going to come back either smoothly to its original position or it's going to swing back and forth and come to its original position. The dynamics of that is determined simply by applying Newton's law of motion which says mass times acceleration equals sum of the external forces. The external forces are the one due to the spring itself, so the force is proportional to the load on the spring. The other one is proportional to the dash part, the force caused by the dash part, which is proportional to the rate of motion, the velocity if you like. And these are models. So the spring constant is a constant, and the dashboard constant is a constant. And then you have an external force, which is the input. Okay. So we want to look at the dynamics of such a system. And we are already posing the problem in terms of the deviation variable, because y is the displacement measured from its equilibrium position. Equilibrium position, we label it as zero. From that, how does it move? 
and uh, does it decay? So this is the second order system. It's another example of a second order system. We have seen an example of two first order systems in the last few lectures that is equivalent to a second order system. The dynamics of this is equivalent to a second order system. So here we are looking directly at a second order system. In an exam, you should be able to convert this into an equivalent set of two first order equations. So we can have to do that. Not given in the assignment, I guess. Maybe on the need, I will give you one topic for that. I would post it as an equivalent set of two first order equations by introducing new variables, y1 and y2. But what I'm going to focus here is on just the dynamical response, the type of responses that are possible from a second order system. How does the second order system differ fundamentally from a first order system? We have already seen what is the characteristic response of a first order system? Exponential, exponential rise or exponential decay. Okay? Because when you have a single equation dy dt equals a times y, a is just a number, the only solution that is possible is e to the power a t. Okay? And uh, a has to be real in this case because why? That's a, that's a good question. Why should, in, in a first order system like this, I say that a has to be a real number? A would be the eigenvalue. If you have two by two matrix, then eigenvalues have to be calculated from there. Okay, but if you have only one number, that becomes itself the eigenvalue. Okay? Because this is coming from a real problem, alpha has to be a real number. Whereas in a two by two system, you have all real coefficients, a11, a12, a21, a22, all the real coefficients, but the eigenvalues can still be complex. And we will see why in this particular present problem as well. Okay? So, because A can be real, it cannot have any oscillatory response. So a purely first order system can have only exponential decay or exponential growth. It cannot have an oscillatory component. For that, we need to have an imaginary path because it is e to the power i dt, something like this, that gives you the cost and the sign. Okay, so if this is not there, then you're not going to have an oscillatory response. But the moment you have a second order system, the dynamics can fundamentally change. You can have a complex root, you can have an oscillatory behavior. Okay? And that's what this problem is focusing on. Okay, so here is a model, a second order ordinary differential equation. And I define these constants W over K GP as tau square. And C over K, I'm defining it as zeta times tau. So there are two numbers, there are two coefficients that fundamentally ca characterize the response of a second order system. In the first order case, they have only one time constant. In the second order case, we have two time constants, but they can be reposed, uh, reformulated in this problem. So these are two fundamental numbers, tau and zeta. Yeah? Uh, that's a good question. It's just a matter of convenience because Remember, this is going to give us a quadratic equation. And in the, in the quadratic equation, when you're solving it, you're going to have b square minus 4a, uh, b square minus 4ac, right? So to absorb that 4 into this 2, they're just sort of 2 there. But you don't have to have it. All you need to recognize is when you're solving a quadratic equation to find the roots, the roots of the quadratic equations are your eigenvalues, okay? So you're, you're going to find it whatever this constant. If I call this a or alpha, if I call this beta, the entire thing, 2 zeta tau as beta, just use them as the numbers and find the two eigenvalues. But in control literature, this is a common way of putting these constants as tau square and the second one is 2 zeta tau. And that's simply because um, when you see later on, uh, You'll find, uh, let me see, come to that. Yeah, here it is. These are the two roots. Okay? So if you write it in that particular form as 2 zeta tau, the two roots will be given by these two expressions. If you write it any other way, you're going to just use those numbers and find out these two roots. So th those can, I guess, kind of throw you off. Why, why is there all of a sudden two there, right? Um, it's just for making the algebraic manipulations a bit simpler later on. There is really no fundamental reason why the two should be there. Okay. So, but 
any second order problem can be cast in this form. Okay? And that means from the fundamental problem you should know what the primitive variables are. What does W mean? What does K mean? What does C mean? C is the uh, dash part constant, K is the spring constant, W is the mass. Okay? This could be completely different in an electrical circuit or it could be completely different in a chemical reactor, the meaning of these. But you combine them to define your tau square and to define your two zeta tau. So these are two numbers now. Okay? So if tau square, for example, happens to be 25 and this happens to be 5, then I can find out what tau is. Tau is 5 and then I can find out what zeta is. Zeta is going to be 5 divided by 2 times 5. Right. Well, tau and zeta are two numbers that are derived from the problem in terms of the known values of the coefficient. And zeta is called a damping factor. So this is where the meaning, we are, uh, we are ascribing a particular meaning to these two numbers. One is a time constant, the other one is a damping factor. What is a damping factor? We'll see that later on. Okay. So the next step is we're going to take the Laplace transform of this differential equation. And in as a second order equation. So when you take the Laplace transform of the second order term, you're going to get tau square s square y and s plus this constant two zeta tau times s y of s, because that's the Laplace transform of the first derivative, plus y of s equals x of s. X of s is the input supporting function. Okay. And then you can you have a quadratic equation, so you need to solve this to get what do we want to get? We want to get y of s as something times x of s. We need to find out what that something is. Okay. So, all the, uh, I mean, in this case, simply gather all the y of s terms. So, the three places and factor them out. So, you're going to get y of s multiplied by tau square s square plus 2 zeta tau s plus 1 equals x of s. So we can write it as a ratio of y of s equals some constant times x of s. So this is the input output model, the relationship between the input x of s, the force on the door, for example, and the output, the response of the door to displacement, is given by this transfer function. Now we are set. We can use MATLAB, we can do simulate to look at the response of the door, for example, for various types of inputs. Accept or question. Still be a second order equation. That's a very good question. If I didn't have, what you're asking is, if I didn't have this first order term, okay, if I didn't have this, what would change? It would still remain a second order equation. How is the order of a differential equation determined? By the highest order term. Okay? So what would happen? What would happen is this term wouldn't be there if I didn't have this first order term. But I would still have s squared. Okay? And that would mean I would not have this term, but I will have still have s square. S square comes from the second derivative. So I can always factor that as something like 1 over s plus s1 times s plus s2. So it's equal, this is where, when we do this factorization, you can see that it is equivalent to two star system. Because each one will give you a e to the power s1t, e to the power s2t. Even if you don't have a first order term. It will still remain a second order system. That's what you're asking, right? We don't have the first order system that has changed the characteristic. Uh, no, no, okay. Uh, that you will see later on. The damping determines is determined by the value of zeta. Okay? There is something called a critical damping, and that's what you're going to get. And zeta is equal to zero. But, uh, yeah. So that's the order of the differential equation determines the order of your transfer function. Okay, the second order term in your differential equation, then you're going to always get a second order term for function. Okay, which is equal to two first order terms. Now, response. If I take a step response, then the Laplace transform of the unit step response is one over s. So I replace that x of s by that. So y of s is given by this. Now you know how to get back to the domain if you want, or use MATLAB just to plot the response. Okay. 
So what we need to do is I'm going to factorize this term, okay, factor the quadratic and use partial fraction, then inverse. That's one procedure that we have seen. Okay. And the roots of the quadratic are given by this. Now you notice why we put the 2 there and what is the meaning of zeta squared. If zeta is greater than 1, what happens? It's real. Okay. If zeta is less than 1, it's complex. Okay. And there are a pair of complex plus and minus, pair of complex roots. If zeta is equal to 1, then you get a critical damping factor. Okay? So zeta equal to 0 is the term that you're talking about, and the term doesn't exist at all. Then you will always get a complex one. This tells you that you'll always get a complex one. And physically, you can understand that in the door example, because when zeta is equal to 0, that means there is no damping. Remember, if you go back to the original model, uh, the C is the one that is related to the damping, and that is related to zeta, the first derivative. So if I make C equal to zero, that means I don't have a first derivative at all, then there is no damping mechanism. So if I apply a force and there's a spring, the spring is going to always give you an oscillatory response. So when zeta is zero, there will always be an uh, oscillatory response to that. Any other questions? I'm just, I'm not going to solve it each case, but I do expect you to be able to solve it, whatever way you want, okay? By doing partial fractions, inverting it, going to MATLAB, using it, you should be able to go from this step to this step, every one of them like that. I'm going to look at subtle examples. But for the underdamped system, when zeta is less than 1, if you do the I Laplace of this, you will get the solution in the time domain like this. And this doesn't have, um, <coughs> sorry, this has a sign term. Sign term is the one that gives you the oscillation. So an under that system means that it's going to have an oscillatory, but a decaying response. You see the decay here, e to the power minus zeta over tau. Okay? So it's an oscillatory decaying response. And the curve is going to look like this. These are curves for various values of uh, zeta, zeta of 0 0.2, 0 0.4, all the way approaching 1. What you see is as zeta is far away from 1, okay, the degree of oscillation is much higher. Like when it, zeta is close to 0, 0 0.4, the oscillation is much larger than when it approaches 1. When zeta equal to 1, you'll find the curve is something like this. So that when zeta equal to 1, you call it as a critical damping. There is no overshoot. So we're going to use a lot of these terminologies. You should have a physical understanding of what these terminologies mean. Okay. Now, is this kind of a response that you would like in a reactor or an indistillation column? It takes a long time. When, for example, it happens that my zeta is 0.2, it takes a long time to come back to the steady state or to go to a new steady state when you make a step response. And the path towards that steady state is not nice. It just keeps oscillating. So in during this entire period, if you see the distillation column, what's going to happen? You have gasoline that is coming at the other end. You cannot concentration is going to be changing, right? So if it is a polymer, you know, polymer quality is going to be changing. So this is basically going to be offset. You know, you have to throw it out. So you you would not want that. So you would ideally want the Control to take it to a new steady state as quickly as possible and without any oscillation. Okay? That's why it's important to understand what are the dynamical responses that are possible and how we can influence that. Okay? And this way of looking at the problem gives you the way of handling that. Any questions on that? So zeta less than 1 is going to give you an underdamped system. Typical rep uh, uh, responses like this. And I have given you a MATLAB code for a specific case, zeta equals 0.5 equals to 1. Just go through this and shows you how to generate a graph like this, okay, uh, using the MATLAB code and how to plot it. The second case, a critically damped system when zeta is equal to 1. You can use the same code here and put zeta equal to 1 here and then solve it. And when you get 
the analytical response using I Laplace, okay, you are going to get a function that looks like this. Is that stable or unstable? It's stable because you have minus T over tau. Now tau is a time constant, it has to be a positive number. Okay. So um, but it has an interesting behavior and that is this Beta equal to 1 corresponds to what? If you go, go back to the two eigenvalues, what do the two eigenvalues look like when beta equal to 1? Minus beta over tau, they are both the same. Okay? So this is what we call eigenvalues of multiplicity 2. The same eigenvalue occurs twice. Okay? And in the third order system, you might have the same eigenvalue appearing three times. But these occur only at very special values of the parameter, like here, zeta has to be zero. Now zeta is typically a parameter like a flow rate or inlet cooling water rate, and uh, you don't expect to give you a critical damping condition. So any value that you pick will give you either over damp or under damp. To operate it under critical damp condition, you need to have a particular value for your cooling water rate. That's not going to be always possible to achieve that. So the important point to notice is under the critically damped situation you have repeated roots. And the critical damping. Okay, that means zeta equals one, exactly at that value. And when you have that, you have a curve that looks like your first order curve, a very smooth uh, trajectory to the steady state, but there is a T there. Okay. It's, uh, there is a solution that depends very as time. Okay. So that would be the example of a critically damped system, zeta equal to one. Okay. It goes in the quickest possible way, and it reaches the steady state without any oscillation. An ideal kind of uh, dynamic response. Now, if you have an over damped system that is zeta greater than 1, then it could be many numbers okay, greater than 1, then you will find the solution has no sine or cosine. Remember, sine h and cosine h are exponential functions. Okay, remember the definition for sine h? e to the power x or e to the power minus x or something like that. Okay. So they, those always give you a very smooth um, path towards the new steady state for different values of uh, zeta. But they increase the response time. Okay? So they don't have to reach the steady state as quickly as they're equal to one. Any questions? Okay. So th the next graph shows you a combination of all of them. Okay. From beta equals less less value, like 0 0.2, you get extremely large overshoot. And we don't want that. And uh, zeta equal to one, which is the critical one, like that. No over uh, overshoot, but it reaches the steady state uh, nicely. And then you have an over damped system, something like this. Okay. So you should be able to generate this graph given a second order system or two first order system also possible to produce all these responses for any system higher than the first order. So this graph is like the generic graph that I gave you and I asked you to use in the first midterm exam where you had y versus a t uh, versus tau. Okay. That response curve was just one curve. For any first order system you could use that curve to interpret and answer specific numerical questions. This is like that curve. Okay. If I give you this curve and then ask you to answer a few questions, then you should be able to interpret that. Now, the few terminologies that we are using in here to summarize is basically less than one. The nature of the root is complex, and you get an underdamped or oscillatory response. Okay. If it is equal to one, then you get equal to one, you get real and equal roots. This is what I call equal roots. So it's critically damped and when you have greater than one, you have an over damped response. 
Um, here are some terminologies that are important that are good for a short question for an example. Okay? What is a uh, right time? What is a period, etc. So when you have an underdamped system, a second order underdamped system, you define the period in exactly the same way that you will normally do. The distance between peak to peak or the distance between zero crossing to zero crossing. That is a period T. And that is an important measure because it tells you how large the dynamics is going to take before it reaches a steady state. It cannot occur within a period of T. It has to occur maybe two or three T. So if you know what T is, the capital T, the period, then you can say, okay, I need to wait at least two or three times that for it to be able to reach a steady state. And the response time limit is something that you define as the time, here it is, okay, the time that it takes before the variation in the amplitude is smaller than a certain acceptable number. So you can say it should be less than 5% variation from the steady state. To define that as your goal, I want the product purity to be within plus or minus 5%. Then I accept that as acceptable product quality. And the question is, how long does it take to reach there? And that time is what you call the response time. So the question might be, what is the response time for this particular dynamical graph that you see? So you should be able to just read the graph and pull out that number so that you have an idea of is it two hours or is it 20 minutes or whatever. Okay. And the third one is the amplitude ratio. A is the maximum distance at the very first overshoot. Okay. And uh, B is this distance from the step response, the magnitude of the step response from 0 to 1. And C is the next amplitude, okay, the, current, the first one and then the second one. So using these numbers, you can define a few measures that a process control engineer should be monitoring. In addition to monitoring the response time of the period, you should be monitoring what is called the degree of overshoot. Okay. The degree of overshoot is if I make a step, step response, is it going to twice the step response? Or is it going to three times? That ratio, A over B, is called the degree of overshoot. In the designing, we want to make sure that that degree of overshoot is as small as possible, so that you don't overshoot too much. Okay? And then the DK ratio is another important thing. The DK ratio is how fast the peak is decreasing towards zero. Okay? And that is characterized by C divided by A the decay ratio. So these things we need to memorize because these are just terminologies we need to know what it is. So I can ask you a question, what is the decay ratio? You need to be able to define it. And if I give you all these numbers, you should be able to calculate it. Or if I give you a graph, you should be able to uh, estimate what that is. Okay, so decreasing, diminishing. So here the peak is at A first time, and then it is at C the second time. Okay, so we want that to decay as quickly as possible. So we want a very large decay ratio. A should be large, C should be small. Okay, that's one criterion. The other criterion is A itself should not be very large. Okay, and that would be the overshoot. So, so ideally, we want the overshoot to be small, so that A is small, but we want the decay ratio to be large. That is, we want it to decay very quickly. Okay. Sorry, we defined it as Q over A, right? That should also be small. And really, right time should also be small. We want the time to reach a new steady state should be as quickly as possible. And there is an analytical expression for each one of those for a second order system. So if you know the solution, if you know the parameters, you should be able to estimate all these numbers, overshoot, decay ratio, the period of oscillation, etc. And I don't expect you to remember these, so I will put these in a formula sheet. But I may ask you to derive, show that the decay ratio is given by this. You should be able to do that. Any questions on that? Okay. So we looked at the step response to a second order system. How does an impulse response look like? 
So the transfer function is still the same. And the impulse response is basically what is the Laplace transform of the impulse response? Remember? Laplace transform of the response is 1 over s. Okay. Impulse response is just 1. Okay. So you take that and then do the I Laplace and get the analytical result for each case. And zeta is less than 1, zeta is equal to 1, and zeta is greater than 1. And you will find the same type of behavior, whether it is step response or impulse response. In fact, for any other type of arbitrary response, if it is an underdamped system, you'll get oscillatory response. So what is the difference between a step response and an impulse response? Step response takes you to a new steady state. Impulse response is a disturbance, so it brings it back. It rejects the disturbance, and the system comes back to its original steady state. So the response will be centered around zero for an impulse response. That is, for a step response, it will be centered around one, the new step. Okay? That's the only difference. Other than that, you will find that the idea of a critically damped system versus uh, over damped and under damped are exactly the same. So because, why is that? Let me ask you that. Well, I just made a statement that the nature of the response of a critically damped system, over damped system, and under damped system is the same whether I excite it by a step response or are they excited by an impulse response? Question is why? They are determined by the same transfer function. The output is the x of s. Sorry, the input is this x of s. So you can have any type of excitation, but the dynamics is determined by the transfer function itself, the model itself. The model determines the dynamic response. So the transfer function is the same transfer function. All I have changed is for step response I put it as one or s. For impulse response I just put it as one. Okay. So this is the forcing. The way that I force the system is different, but the way that the system responds is going to be basically the same characteristics. When I have an under that, uh, sorry, over that system, zero equals less than one, I will get this kind of an oscillatory. Farther away from one, larger the amplitude. Okay. And when uh, zeta equal to one, I'm going to get a critical response. Okay. That will basically, yeah, in this case, I guess with the decrease there. Without any oscillation, it will decay to one. And you can see that in the analytical expression. Here we have a sine, here we have a purely exponential one, here you have again a purely exponential one. But it should shoot up first because it's an impulse. So as a response to an impulse, it will shoot up. That doesn't mean that it is oscillating. Because originally it was here, it's shooting up, and then it is coming back gradually without any further oscillation to the steady state. And as an under damped system, it shoots up, but it also shoots down and then up again. Okay? That is characteristic that characteristic is the same. Whether you have a uh, Step response or the impulse response. Are we going fast? Yeah, the symbol is zeta, right. Which one? This one? Yeah. Is this zeta? It's not zeta? Maybe I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> I'm not a Greek. Yeah, I, I always write psi as this. Here? <laughs> okay. It's a uh, it's a font. I, I'll blame the font. <laughs> I'll make computer. <laughs> they have the same symbol. What is important for us to know that it's the same symbol I'm talking about? It's the same, isn't it? Is it me or <laughs> I see this symbol as the same as the previous one? Ah uh, ah uh, ah! Uh, yeah yeah yeah. Okay. That's that's it. You you you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, now I know the answer. <laughs> the difference is I created this in words, you not you have a math font. Okay. 
equations. When you're using equations, this was created with the math font. The other one was probably created with the symbol font. <laughs> okay. My apologies for the confusion there, but they are the same symbol time. Sorry, beta. I call this beta. Psi to me is this. <laughs> right. All right. Small digression there. Um, I think, yeah, that's probably a good place to stop. I'm sure we have the next class. So, we'll continue on Monday from this point. Yeah, we know if we're going to so much.